Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good night, depending on where you're joining us. Thank you so much for being in our eight site presentation lecture. This time we will discuss the recognition of pulmonary vein stenosis in premature infants, updates on current mechanisms, diagnosis, management, and long-term follow-up. For that, we have the amazing Dr. Philip Levy. Phil is an assistant professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and an anatologist at Boston Children's Hospital. His patient-oriented and translational research initiatives focus on cardiac mechanics, cardiac mechanics in congenital and acquired cardiopulmonary diseases. His research is part of a larger international collaborative that was established to examine emerging measures of cardiac function and pulmonary hemodynamics in large preterm birth cohorts to define physiological and pathological patterns of postnatal cardiac adaptation. Moderating this session, he will be joined by Dr. Erica MacArthur, who is a second year neonatology fellow at Emory University in Atlanta. Her fellowship scholarly works is focused on pulmonary vein stenosis in premature infants. Thank you so much, Phil. Uh, and, and, and thank you for that introduction. It's, it's really uh, nice to be with everybody uh, wherever they are in the world. So um, I'm, I'm really privileged to be able to to be able to give this opening talk that I think any one of the 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 five people you see on the screen could give. Um, alongside uh, moderating after this talk will be uh, Erica MacArthur and then our panelists who will introduce afterwards. And I just want to again thank the Neonatal Hemodynamics Research Center, Laura Thomas and Amish Jane and Patrick for the opportunity. And then I put a little QR code here that people can feel free to pull out their camera that, that will take you to the Neonatal Hemodynamics Research Center website, where we have a lot of information on upcoming webinars, seminars, uh, information about PAS and all the different conferences, educational activities uh, that uh, are available uh, for free to everybody uh, around the world. Um, so uh, as Daniel mentioned, my, my talk today is on recognition of pulmonary vein stenosis going to really come at it from a neonatologist and a hemodynamic standpoint. And this QR code um, here will actually take you to the PDF version of this talk. I'll give people a moment if they want to pull it out and look at it. And then I'll have the QR code again at the end of the talk as well. Um, and again, really pleased to be here. So um, a, a lot of this work or my uh, engagement and involvement started with pulmonary vein stenosis when I came to Boston in 2018, I had the opportunity to work with uh, Ryan Callahan, who uh, is now at, at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and we'll hear more from him later, but working with the experts and the leaders in the field up here in Boston and around the country in Atlanta and Texas and Toronto, we were able to kind of put together a series of papers on um, neonates and infants and understanding pulmonary vein stenosis from diagnosis to management. And um, this was led by uh, Kathy Jenkins, uh, really a, a forefront leader in this field. And here is a, a, a QR code that links you to, I think it's now 19 unique articles on pulmonary vein stenosis. And for those, it's really nicely summarized here that it's a progressive obliteration of the pulmonary vein lumen um, and it's really a rare condition uh, in infants and very young children, and it can be present at birth. But I think in our population as neonatologists, it, it more commonly develops later in either their association with congenital heart disease, I'll, I'll show some uh, epidemiology and etiologies, and then also with pulmonary conditions, especially in the premature infants, um, and it's really rare in isolation. Um, so three cases popped out at me that I actually think Ryan was involved with over the last four or five years. And, and all of them ended up with pulmonary vein stenosis, dif different forms, different vessels, different interventions, but all three were rooted um, in the pulmonary vein stenosis diagnosis. So the first case was a three-month-old X24 weaker, appropriately grown preterm infant. It's now 40 weeks, developed severe BPD, was still ventilated, had 80% FiO2 requirement, had retinopathy of prematurity, and had serial echocardiograms that showed pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary vascular disease. The second case was one that really struck me. It was a 36-week growth-restricted 1.4 kilo female. Most of us know that at 36 weeks, you should be 2, 2.5 kilos by then. Now 44 weeks, had a large VSD, significant left to right shunting, developed necrotizing enterocolitis, 
had persistent CPAP support, multiple infections, and, and the serial echocardiograms revealed worsening heart failure. And the third case was a 28-week-old growth-restricted 900-gram male, now 36 weeks, who for all intents and purposes was growing and developing on, on some low-flow nasal cannula. And the echocardiograms that we had done just because the baby was on on some respiratory support showed no evidence of chronic pulmonary hypertension, but all three of these children ended up developing different forms and levels of, of this intraluminal pulmonary vein stenosis that I'll talk about in a few minutes. So for me, the important questions to answer or to ask myself is, you know, what, what are the epidemiology and risk factors of premature related PVS? I really want to understand the cardiopulmonary vascular principles of prematurity, AKA the hemodynamics of PVS. And as it relates to this group of neonatologists who, who care for babies with different hemodynamic perturbations. And then finally, I'll touch upon, but we'll really deal with this in the Q and A period, screening, diagnosis, treatment, and even understanding disease trajectory in premature related pulmonary vein stenosis. So when I think of the etiology, this comes from a paper by uh, Vivian Nassar, who's an anesthesiologist, and Ryan, um, trying to understand pediatric pulmonary venous obstruction. You can have anatomic obstruction, so there can be a compression. You can have post-operative PVS, so scar tissue at the previous site of a surgery, for example, in TAPVR. Or you can have this kind of intraluminal process or this neo-intimal proliferation, which I'll talk about the mechanism in a few moments. And from this, I think there are three kind of unique patterns of intraluminal PVS. There's primary, there's congenital heart disease, and then what we're going to focus on is the prematurity and the chronic lung disease or this acquired intraluminal PVS. And I, I think you can have a lot of insight you, you, trying to understand the classification and understanding that there is a special population of preterm infants, understanding the pulmonary vein involvement, and then all the different comorbidities is what really gives us insight into the disease trajectory and understanding different outcomes. And epidemiology is really, until a few years ago, was not well understood. Most of the reports were single center, either case reports or case series. But back in 2020, uh, Carl Bax in the Journal of Pediatrics did a really nice systematic review and meta-analysis of, of studies of babies less than one year of age. And what what they what he found was that you know premature birth made up you know thirty to forty percent of the cases, infants with BPD or severe lung disease was close to twenty percent, pulmonary hypertension was in over fifty percent of the cases, and what he found was that it's pretty common in preterm infants, and that it presents kind of beyond the neonatal period, beyond the first few months of age, and it goes on in this great paper to talk about involvement of veins you know, uh, number of veins, and then is it on one side or bilateral showing that as suspected, the, the more veins, and if you're bilateral, the, the, the chances of survival kind of go down. And it's kind of these papers that give us insight into the epidemiology and the outcomes. So taking a step further, uh, Shilpa, who's going to be one of our, uh, our, our uh, panelists, you know, she did some nice work with trying to put a lot of this, this data together in a great review in children's, but also some work that was published in the Journal of Perinatology and then also in NEO reviews, really understanding the breakdown of PVS in infants less than one year of age. There's, there's an overwhelming majority of these babies are born premature. There are genetic associations that I'll speak about, idiopathic. There are cardiac defects. That, that's a, a talk for another time. But there's significant overlap with the severe BPD population and then those children who have pulmonary hypertension. So this nice figure really sums up probably the last 10, 15 years worth of, of work from single case reports and the meta-analysis. So what about the principles of prematurity? So I, I think most people would agree with this. There are so many different three-letter acronyms in prematurity, but I think the morbidity goes up the younger the gestational age you're born at. And that holds true for things like neck and ROP and PDA and even for PVS. So I like to take a step back because I think it's important to understand the lung, heart and vascular development. And I think most of us are familiar with the five stages of lung development that begins in that embryonic phase. But it's fascinating to me that cardiac morphogenesis actually precedes airway development 
And then the vascular development, both on the arterial side and the venous side, develops from a temporal and spatially controlled process that's linked both to the heart and the lung. So they all three kind of go hand in hand. And when we break down that embryonic stage and look at cardiac development, we know that there's two formation and looping and outflow tract septation. What's fascinating to me, and this is just an example because I treat a lot of babies with pulmonary hypertension, is that second heart field highlighted in blue develops into the right ventricle and the outflow tract. So any perturbations or injury to that second heart field can lead to problems with pulmonary hypertension disease physiology after birth. And we are now learning in multiple venues and avenues that there are significant key regulators for each one of these processes and stages of looping and outflow tract septation. We also know that the preterm myocardium is just at risk for different loading conditions. And just two examples I can give you where we're trying to determine cellular metabolism, and it's the balance between preload, what goes in the heart, afterload, how you get the blood out of the heart, and contractility. I think this group is very well aware that as you go up on preload, you're going to alter stroke volume with the Frank Starling curves, but that immature heart can only do so much compared to the mature heart. And similarly, with kind of the force frequency relationship, as you go up on your afterload, you can only augment stroke volume to such an extent. And what we've learned, at least with contractility, that right ventricle is at a disadvantage to the left ventricle. So if you put in a state of prematurity, and then you put on top of that pulmonary vein stenosis, and then you add in the loading conditions, that can lead to a horrible recipe for disaster. Add one more piece of the puzzle. We know that the contractile state of the preterm heart is just underdeveloped, where there's a higher collagen to protein ratio in figure A. And in figures B and C, you can see that the severe fibrosis and inflammatory pathways are much more pronounced in the preterm limb. All of this leads to a state of decreased contractile preterm myocardium. So I just gave you a situation where you have altered loading conditions, you have prematurity, you don't respond by increasing your contractility and your stroke volume, and then you add on another insult with pulmonary vein stenosis. Again, it's a recipe for disaster. Myocyte development is also important that people overlook. You have hyperplasia with multiplying of the cells that leads to hypertrophy and expanding of the cells. But any perturbation, prematurity, hypoxia, inflammation, and even steroids will shift that paradigm backwards. And you have essentially a loss of cardiomyocyte endowment. So that heart cannot handle the changes in loading conditions, the changes in contractility, and any extra insults such as pulmonary vein stenosis. So I like to think about this with the hemodynamics. So as your afterload goes up, your performance is gonna meet that demand. You initially will access the functional reserve, you hit some peak function, but eventually the heart can't handle it. It will essentially uncouple from its afterload and ultimately fail. There's a nice picture by my colleague, Afif al Kufash, which shows this nicely. The heart will initially hypertrophy, then dilate in stage two, and then fail in stage three. So again, what I'm trying to show you is the preterm myocardium is at such a disadvantage from the get-go that other insults will lead it to a state of failure. Now, what about lung development? We know that there's these five stages and everything seems to revolve around the development of BPD or bronchopulmonary dysplasia, which again, this group is very familiar with. And I think we're very aware that, that BPD is just a dysregulation of every single process from the pulmonary vasculature with angiogenesis and vasculogenesis to the alveoli. This is what should happen normally in that saccular and alveolar stage. But bring in prematurity, prolonged ventilation and oxygenation, postnatal steroids, and even inflammation, you have impaired alveolar development, decreased lung angiogenesis, and then you have this remodeling process that leads to what we call simplified alveolar structures or this kind of new BPD. So a lot of this is actually tied with the vascular endothelial growth factor signaling. There are multiple other pathways, but this potentially could be a link with pulmonary vein stenosis. And I'll show you in a few slides what I mean by this. What about pulmonary venous development? This is courtesy of, of Satyan, who's done great pictures for a paper that we, we put out earlier this year. 
where we have lung development on the top going through the five stages through term birth. And then you have pulmonary vein development with the carnal veins, the common pulmonary vein, and then kind of tracking from the lungs into that left atrium. And then finally in that saccular and alveolar stage, there's the full formation of, of the lung development, the heart development, and the pulmonary venous development. And when I like to summarize it all up, in that embryonic stage that I had mentioned, there is the cardiac development. We also know that there's lung development at four weeks. And by five weeks, you see that vascular development. And there's really a progression from figures A to figure C, where you have the lung formation. You have the tube that's forming and twisting and turning that by five weeks, you have this multi-layered vessel connection between the heart, the lungs, and this venous uh, uh, connection. So again, really showing you this developmental process over uh, the fetal stages. So when I think about it, I, I borrowed this slide from Steve Admin. There's, there's normal cardiovascular endowment. You have normal development in aging and any type of primary insult. So again, prematurity, genetic, growth restriction will kind of disrupt this process and lead to increased susceptibility, but it's a secondary insult, in my opinion, probably hemodynamic, hypoxia, disease-related, infection, that's going to kind of unmask or lead to a clinical phenotype highlighted in yellow, and then lead to different cardiovascular outcomes. So, so what about risk factors? So the risk factors that have been reported in the literature range from growth restriction in neck and ROP, there's genetics, hemodynamic changes, late pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary vascular disease and BPD. So, so let's, let's delve a little bit more into that to understand the mechanisms. So the pathogenesis of BPD, I think, again, most of us are very familiar with. There's intrauterine and postnatal lung development, everything from RDS to mechanical ventilation to placental insufficiency. There are genetic, epigenetic, nutritional, there's hemodynamic changes. And then, of course, there's inflammation states or inflammatory states, and then processes with angiogenesis and vascular genesis. So this pathogenesis pathway actually seems to overlap with pulmonary vein stenosis, highlighted in yellow are some of the reported mechanisms that impact the pulmonary vein development and growth over time. And then, of course, there's that inflammatory state. And I think it's important for us to really look at the inflammation around BPD to understand what's happening during pregnancy, what's happening during the transition and resuscitation, and what's happening in that NICU environment. And, and you can see that it's issues with the placenta, issues with infection, issues with ventilation, issues with, nut with, with nutrition. All of this leads to different inflammatory states that have been well chronicled a lot by Alan Job and his work, but really leading to changes with over distension, airway injury, lung fibrosis, that's the old BPD. And then with the new BPD, that's happening in more of the canicular stage and the saccular stage, alveolarization, vascularization, and remodeling. So just hold on to this inflammation piece because it's going to become important as we talk about the interaction between pulmonary vein stenosis and BPD. And what, what we find is that you have fibroblasts that seem to differentiate into the myofibroblasts. And then with this inflammatory state and in this picture, both on the left and the right, you have kind of myofibroblast proliferation, which can then lead to this neo-intimal proliferation, which can lead to intraluminal pulmonary vein stenosis. And this kind of signaling pathway from the periocyte to the endothelial cell down to the myocyte is all really revved up by this vascular endothelial growth factor. And there are many other uh, mechanisms within this, but I'm just highlighting the VEGF because that seems to potentially be a link back to chronic lung disease and BPD, as I mentioned. So what about other states where we know VEGF is a problem? So we know with retinopathy of prematurity that with preterm birth and hyperoxia, you have a decrease in VEGF signaling, which leads to varying states of retinopathy of prematurity. And then as our metabolic demand decreases and you have hypoxia, the VEGF, the way I describe it, is essentially goes crazy and it happens in this kind of late neonatal period, which seems to correlate with when pulmonary vein stenosis would develop in these preterm infants. What about necrotizing enterocolitis? We know that from an embryological standpoint, the cardiac lumen and the splanchic plexus seem to develop around the same time. 
So in some nice animal work and studies, they've really looked at all of these different signaling pathways in regards to necrotizing enterocolitis. And a, and a common theme is this expression over under of intestinal VEGF, potentially another link to the pulmonary vein stenosis. What about fetal growth restriction? What, what we know is that with the maternal and the genetic and the placental factors, all of this seems to kind of predispose that fetal heart and then the postnatal heart to altered loading conditions. As I mentioned earlier, with changes in afterload, preload, and its response with contractility, all of this leads to potential impaired diastolic inflow of the pulmonary veins into the left atrium. We'll get into this a little bit more with some stretch and stress and wall shear stress and flow dynamics in a few minutes. What about the relationship between BPD and pulmonary vascular development? We, we know that if you have severe BPD from this nice meta-analysis, you have likely you know, somewhere 40 to 60% of those children are at risk to develop pulmonary hypertension or the late pulmonary hypertension. We also uh, kind of know that you can not have any evidence of lung disease at 36 weeks, so that no BPD or mild BPD category, but you can still develop evidence of pulmonary vascular disease and pulmonary hypertension. Similarly, you can also develop evidence of pulmonary vein stenosis, and I'll talk about that in a few moments. So when I think of chronic pulmonary hypertension of infancy, and this will go into some of our discussion about screening and recognition of clinical symptoms, we know that it could be due to maldeveloped pulmonary vasculature when your PVR is high. So for example, trisomy 21, we know it could be a maladaptive process. So BPD is an example. And then we also know that with a rise in mean pulmonary artery pressure, depending how you want to define that, it could be changes in what I call left heart disease or cardiac dysfunction with increased pulmonary blood flow, like we have in a PDA that's shunting left to right or VSD and then increased pulmonary artery or pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which again, that could give us insight into the connection between this acquired premature related pulmonary vein stenosis and the chronic pulmonary hypertension of infancy. So what about kind of this, this, this pulmonary vein development? So I actually learned this from Ryan with, from several conversations, Ryan Callahan, who's gonna be one of our, our panelists for those who are joining late. But basically, with the development of these pulmonary veins, they have to kind of track through kind of the lungs and then to the left atrium. And they can have angulations, they could be stretched, they could have perturbations if you have for BPD. But the bottom line is that all of this shear stress, all of the stretching, which I'm going to show you some data in a few moments, can lead to some turbulent blood flow, which can then also lead to this fibroblastic remodeling with the uh, myofibroblasts and the neointimal proliferation. So BPD, pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary vein stenosis. This, this comes from some animal work. We're looking at lung hyperinfl hyperinflation and fibrosis. You have what we call a mechanical stretch or traction of the pulmonary veins. It essentially leads to this fibroblast and the differentiation into the myofibroblast with the stretch of that extracellular matrix. You have myofibroblast proliferation. And essentially you have then pulmonary venous obstruction. So that's one thought process. Another area, which I'm hoping to hear more uh, from Ryan and his discussions, because I think this is a potentially uh, a future novel approach to characterizing these babies is understanding wall shear stress. So if you have increased shear stress, that leads to proliferation, luminal obstruction, flow redistribution, and then you have increased flow in the unaffected vessels, which can really just start the whole process all over again. So in a nice study that's actually published in children's, um, what was able to be shown, again, this is just from one patient looking at kind of the left uh, lower, the left upper, and the right lower pulmonary veins, using CT and using wall shear stress, they're able to kind of look at different interventions. The B is balloon dilation and the S is stent placement. And they know that there's kind of an upper limit of normal of what the wall shear stress should be. So anything above 10 here. And then they know from other work that neo interval hyperplasia occurs between about 26 and 50. And that the degree above that, you can see with these different interventions, how the wall shear stress will fall. 
And eventually, if you, if you look at this kind of highlighted in red, this left lower pulmonary vein, it seems to fall below that kind of neo-intimal hyperplasia range. Now, this is just really in one patient, and they reported on a second patient, but could there be a possibility of using these advanced physics metrics to predict the target lumen size necessary to reduce the vein and the wall shear stress to normal levels where there will no longer be a trigger for stenosis progression? We'll learn more about this kind of in the, the cath approach and all of our diagnose, diagnostic and therapeutic interventions, but this really ties the mechanism into some of the therapeutic interventions. What about nutrition? You know, it's really interesting. You know, if you have a child with severe BPD, a severe BPD phenotype, we have started to advocate for thinking about feeding these children, uh, you know, jejunally or, or, or post pyloric because we think that there is a relationship with aspiration and worsening of the BPD status. So uh, um, this group, again, uh, the group in Boston kind of looked at aspiration as a mechanism for worsening the pulmonary vein uh, uh, obstruction. So thinking that there's decreased lung elastins and airway hyperinflation, increased traction on the pulmonary veins, leads to increased shear stress, fibroblast and myofibroblast differentiation, this intraluminal cell proliferation, and then kind of this recurrent pulmonary vein stenosis. So they looked at a really uh, unique population of children that they had treated with different biologics. And I'm not going to go into the details of this, but one of the things that, that popped out in their multivariable model that still led to kind of the poor treatment response was the, the, the clinical significant aspiration. So as you're thinking about a child with pulmonary vein stenosis, just clinically as a neonatologist, you could consider feeding these children post-pyloric. So the modifying factors go beyond the, the vein development and BPD and all the hemodynamic contributions I mentioned, there's also a, a genetic piece of this story as well. Not so much in the premature population, but, but it does exist. So this nice paper looked at all the different clinical syndromic phenotypes. And again, from the work that, that Shilpa did, we know that about 20 to 30% of infants less than one year of age have some genetic link. And I've listed on the screen here, it could be Down syndrome or smith lemley opitz or DeGeorge or even Vactoral. And kind of taking this one step farther, working um, with uh, a former uh, a fellow in cardiac interventionalist, uh, Ryan and, and Chloe were able uh, uh, to look at infants with Down syndrome. We know that the progression of pulmonary vein stenosis seems to be a little bit more severe and progressive in this population. So they looked at, a, I think about a 10 year period where they identified 23 infants with Down syndrome who developed pulmonary vein stenosis and then compared it to 69 Down syndrome infants without pulmonary vein stenosis. And what they found to me really unlocked some of the hemodynamic information is that the risk of pulmonary vein stenosis per month of exposure to a left to right shunt, a VSD, ASD, or PDA seemed to go up with each month. Uh, I think the cut point was around four or five months. And then prematurity was also a significant kind of risk factor associated with the trisomy 21 and the pulmonary vein stenosis. So really highlighting all of the previous mechanisms that, I, that I've pointed out. Um, again, this is borrowed from Kathy Jenkins. I really like how she put it together, but you can really enter this, this vicious circle at any point with inflammation, lung disease, growth restriction, genetic or wall shear stress that really all contributes to the development of pulmonary vein stenosis. So what, what I'm going to do in the last kind of two or three minutes before we kind of open it up to our panelists is talk about screening and diagnosis and potential treatment just to whet everybody's appetite. So the American Heart says that all pediatric patients with a new diagnosis should undergo imaging to evaluate for PBS. The PBH network says you screen for PB, PBS when patients with BPD demonstrate worsening late pulmonary hypertension despite the optimization of cardiorespiratory support, AKA what I call the clinical suspicion, or in other words, recognizing the risk factors. So this is a paper that, that we published earlier this year that talks about screening for chronic pulmonary hypertension of infancy. Basically any, any baby uh, who's born less than 32 weeks, who's still on some degree of respiratory support likely deserves an evaluation for pulmonary hypertension. And when that pulmonary hypertension seems out of proportion for what you would expect, you should clearly be thinking about using 
uh, your diagnostic modalities to look for pulmonary vein stenosis. We, we also identify other risk factors. So if you're born less than 28 weeks or you have severe infection or prolonged mechanical ventilation in the first month of age or chorea or oligo, those are other indications to consider screening for pulmonary hypertension a little bit earlier of which you may identify pulmonary vein stenosis. But what we have learned is that pulmonary vein stenosis really develops later in that neonatal period. It's important to understand the phenotypes. Again, when I think of the phenotypes, I think of genetic alveolar pulmonary vascular disease, obstructive and large airway disease. But I think of PVS when, again, the BPD is out of proportion for what I would expect. I can't wean or there's frequent hypoxemia. And the diagnostic evaluation, we'll, we'll go more into this in the Q&A, but really there's many different modalities and we could talk about the the, uh, the uh, negative and positive predictive uh, uh, ability with each one of these, but there's cardiac MR, cardiac CT, lung scan, cardiac cath, and echocardiography. There's also uh, uh, centers that use PVS severity scoring, and we'll hear more about how Ryan integrates this into his management. And it's basically a combination of looking at echocardiography and MRI and CT and understanding the number of vessels that are involved understanding the gradient. You could look at this with Doppler and then understanding focal versus diffuse disease. Treatment paradigm, again, this is kind of borrowed from work that, that Ryan and Kathy Jenkins have done. You have to think about it at the patient level and then at the vessel level where you're looking at stabilization of the disease and then you're looking at maintaining vessel patency. And, and I'd be remorse, I think of it kind of in four in a paradigm of four approaches, there's the general supportive management that I think every neonatologist is very much aware of when it comes to management of pulmonary hypertension and BPD. Before you rush to do intervention, you optimize ventilation, oxygenation, you correct metabolic derangements, you support, and then you, you, you properly sedate. We'll talk more about medical management, emerging novel therapies, cath-based intervention, and then the surgical therapy will, will leave to the end if there's time. I'd be remorse not to mention that there are biological agents that, that again, Ryan has uh, experience uh, using. Um, but again, the take home is that it's focused again on the mechanisms on targeting the VEGF receptors, targeting the angiogenesis, the vascular genesis, targeting growth factors. There's even work looking um, kind of um, at some of the cancer therapies. And, and I'll show an example at the end how this all comes into play. I think this is actually the example. Um, one term child was born, diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension around two months of age. They sent out genetic sequencing, whole exome sequencing that came back positive for this PIK3CA. And basically that allowed the team to then kind of tailor their therapeutic approach to targeting these different pathways. And again, not going into the details of this one child, who had uh, multiple interventions, but really trying to, how do we move this field forward where now with these interventions, we've gone from 20% you know, uh, uh, to hopefully 70% survival rate. So who's high risk? I think babies born le who are less than six months at diagnosis, if you're less than three kilograms at diagnosis, based on the disease severity, the hemodynamics, and then also the comorbidities, and, and this slide, I think, really sums it up, and this is my, my real last slide here, really looking at the etiologies, the developmental window, what's going on with the comorbidities, all of the different mechanisms that I mentioned, hemodynamics, left to right shunting, stretch and flow, wall shear stress, the genetics, and then the course progression, which I'm really curious to hear from, from Nidhi Vargas, who's a pulmonary hypertension and pulmonologist expert, how we think about vessel involvement, anatomic variability, vessel interventions, and comorbidities. And I think this is where the field is moving. And I think I, I borrowed this from Danny Wise, who many of you know, and I, I adopted it to PVS, but we really need to be honest with families. We need to talk about the unknowns. We need to adopt a culture of research, really think about labeling new precision diagnostics for our neonates with pulmonary vein stenosis. And for those um, who missed the beginning of the talk, this is a QR code that takes you directly to the PDF that I'll leave up for a minute. And what I'm going to do is just uh, 
kind of uh, 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 thank everybody who's been involved in all of this research uh, around the country and helped write some of these review papers. And I am going to uh, just stop sharing my screen for a second. Um, and, and again, say thank you to Amish and everybody for the invite to speak. And what we are going to do now is uh, I'm going to ask that uh, if there are questions that have arisen, I should have mentioned at the beginning to put your questions um, in the Q and A, um, and then we will uh, be able, Erica and myself, to kind of address all of the Q and A questions um, and and tailor them uh, and, and put them towards the other um, panelists. So I'm going to pause there and say thank you, and then Erica will introduce our first panelist, and I'll introduce our other two panelists. Okay, wonderful. Um, so I am going to present uh, Dr. Shilpa Vias reed She's a neonatologist and assistant professor at Emory University in Atlanta. Um, her research interests include investigating um, severe bronchopulmonary dysplasia in premature infants, understanding comorbidities such as pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary vein stenosis in these high-risk patients, um, and she has been one of my wonderful research mentors. Awesome. Thank you, Erica and Shilpa. It's great. It's great to have you. The the next two uh, panelists I wanted to just really introduce to the neonatal hemodynamics community because they've, they've really been a friend to me is, uh, the first is Nidhi Varghese. Uh, Nidhi is a pediatric pulmonologist at Texas Children's Hospital and is the medical director of their pulmonary hypertension center. She's an associate professor of pediatrics at Baylor College of Medicine. And her interests lie in obviously pulmonary hypertension and specifically as it relates to developmental lung diseases. Um, Nidhi uh, is originally from New York, and we, we've had multiple conversations uh, uh, over the years about pulmonary hypertension and, and, and Down syndrome, and it's really just great to have you, Nidhi, so thank you for being here. And then our other panelist is Ryan Callahan, who I, I met in 2018 when I joined the faculty at Boston Children. He's a pediatric interventional cardiologist. He uh, sadly, but for really good reasons, uh, moved to Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and now is an assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania Perelman School of Medicine. And to no surprise, his clinical and research interests really lie within the field of pulmonary vein stenosis, fetal cardiac interventions, coronary obstructions in children and young adults. And he was actually, for, for all of you on this call who have cared for babies who have undergone transcatheter ductal closure of the PDA with the Piccolo device, uh, Ryan was instrumental in starting our program in Boston and um, it's really just great to have you all. Um, what, what we're going to do uh, over the next kind of 20 minutes or so is I'd really like to kind of focus our questions. I see questions coming in. I'd like to focus them kind of in batches, um, really to hone in on epidemiology, screening, diagnosis, and then and, and management. And, and we're going to make this as organic as possible, but one of the first places to start with I think it's always important to engage kind of our trainees and, and Erica is, is one of our trainees. And Erica, the, the question that, that I see that has popped up a lot um, is, is how can we get more kind of insight uh, into kind of epidemiology and some of these risk factors and how can we move beyond you know, single center studies where we start with a single center study, but then move to kind of national databases. So I know you've been working on a project and I wanted you to spend just two minutes sharing your thoughts and, and what you've been doing with Shilpa down in Atlanta. And, and your slides are up there. Uh, can you see them? Yes, I can see them. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for having me and for letting me um, present in this forum. This is um, really wonderful. Um, okay, so we can move to the next slide. So I'm um, looking at pulmonary vein stenosis. Um, the data that I have so far is from my local site um, at Emory, but I'm looking um, in the Children's Hospital Neonatal Consortium, um, which is a group of about 40 hospitals um, that are level four NICUs across um, the country and Canada. Um, and so we have a large number um, of hospitals and we have a large database. So I'm looking at the pulmonary vein stenosis diagnosis um, in that database. Um, from what I know so far in the whole national database, there's about 300 patients with pulmonary vein stenosis. And I'm going to be looking specifically um, at infants with severe BPD and who are born um, at less than 32 weeks. So really the preterm population. 
So I looked um, at this, the CHNC database, um, as well as some of our a local PBS database that we have, um, and identified 11 children that were born in the last 12 years at our local center. Um, I started with this group to kind of, um, first of all, validate the PBS diagnosis in the national data set, but also um, to be able to look more closely at the ECHO data and to look at some of the comorbidities a little bit more closely. So I'm interested in looking at the clinical factors that are associated with PBS among premature infants. So we can go to the next slide. So the covariates that I'm looking at are very similar to what we've just discussed um, as potential um, associations with pulmonary vein stenosis. We can go to the next slide. So really I found um, among, this is, this is all infants less than 32 weeks who had severe BPD, um, they had obviously were of lower birth weight um, and lower gestational age, also had a longer um, length of stay. We can go to the next slide. Um, and then here, I think what's interesting, I was able to look and see for all of these babies, um, the duration, um, that, first of all, that they had a left to right shunt, so a large number, um, seven out of the 11, so 64% approximately had a PDA. Um, and then I was able to even find the duration of the PDA. Um, and so for many, it was um, over two months. Um, many of them underwent um, at the time uh, PDA ligation was more common um, than device closure. So many of these patients underwent um, ligation and then some of them resolved spontaneously. But I think the left to right shunt um, was something that I found to be pretty significantly associated with, um, with PBS in this population, or it seemed like there's a big association. Um, all of the babies in this small cohort had pulmonary hypertension. Um, and then neck or SIP or spontaneous intestinal perforation was also quite common. Um, almost all of the babies were on conventional um, ventilation at 36 weeks, so they would have had severe BPD, of course. Okay, you can move to the next slide. Um, then the age at diagnosis I found pretty interesting. So for these babies, um, their um, postmenstrual age was three to six months at diagnosis. Um, then most of them had single vein disease, and most of them were picked up on echo. Um, the hospital that I was looking at and, and this database also is level four NICU. So a lot of these infants were transferred in um, for pulmonary hypertension and were found to have pulmonary vein stenosis. Some of them were also transferred in for surgical procedures um, like for neck um, or a SIP. Um, so that's really what I found in my local data. And it really is um, kind of similar to what we've already discussed. Um, but I think that the small birth weight um, and younger gestational age kind of at in the peri-viable time period is something that that I've noticed in my small local data set. And I'm really looking forward to um, querying the national database. And that study is ongoing to kind of see from a larger group um, what risk factors seem to be associated with pulmonary vein stenosis. Great, Erica. That's, that, that's a wonderful presentation. And I think um... I'm going to look forward to seeing what you find from the Children's Hospital Neonatal Consortium, which again, large 46 center um, 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 children's hospitals with a lot of good data. There's some some nice questions that are coming in. I'm, I'm just going to kind of start to go around. Eric and I are going to kind of go back and forth. But the first one comes from, from Pamela Griffins. Hi, Pam. Um, uh, at Phoenix, who is, is, is a real an expert in caring for children with severe BPD, she asks, among studies evaluating long-term outcomes of PDA treatment, has PVS been included as an outcome variable? I'm, I'm gonna, gonna throw that over to Nidhi and then over to Shilpa to see if you guys have any insight into that. And maybe also maybe also just talk a little bit about how good or how not good ECHO is uh, about screening these kids, Nidhi. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, again, thank you, Phil, for the invitation to be here today. Um, and I'm um, grateful to be part of this very illustrious panel with my colleagues here. Um, so Pam, you know, your question, I actually, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I think that there is still so much emerging about the pulmonary vein stenosis, specifically in this population. There's been a lot of focus on the PDA, you know, um, about the importance of evaluating the PDA, the left to right shunt in this population, and understanding that a prolonged left to right shunt may increase your, um, increase your risk factor for PVS. I think that's still rather novel. You know, that, that is an understanding, that's an appreciation that has not really trickled down to um, studies, to centers, to, um, to the bedside. And I think it's still rather novel. So 
I, I don't believe that it has been a common variable. I think that most of it has been kind of retrospective reviews like Erica is looking at and Phil kind of alluded to in his presentation earlier. Uh, but I do expect that it's something that we will be seeing more in the future as more people are aware of the um, detriment of a prolonged left or right shunt in this population. Great. And, and, and Shilpa, I guess, I guess the question that I always have is you have a child with severe BPD and you and, and it's out of proportion for what you would expect. You know, from I guess maybe from the data you're working with Erica or just in general, is your sense that that echo is good to capture the pulmonary vein stenosis or or in your experience or your center's experience, do you have a protocol which says if you don't see it on echo, when do you move to another diagnostic test? Yeah, um, hey, Phil, thanks for that um, question and for inviting me to be part of this um, panel um, today. Um, we generally use ECHO as a first line um, modality um, for screening for pulmonary hypertension um, in our unit, like most um, neonatal um, intensive care nurseries, um, just because of um, convenience and um, because it is a you know useful tool when it is positive for those babies that um, the pulmonary vein flow velocity is difficult to determine because of the severity of their lung disease um, or that have symptoms that are out of proportion to what is being seen on the echo, meaning they're unable to wean from respiratory support or have continued desaturation events in spite of optimization of all of the kind of medical management we can do. For those kids, we um, do tend to move to CTA since we know that echo, you know, in some instances um, is not as sensitive of a tool for detection of pulmonary vein stenosis as, um, as CTA. And then depending on those uh, results, um, the you know we may move to cath for either or further diagnostic or treatment modalities. I did want to speak for a second to the PDA question as well, um, because I think that is really interesting, um, particularly in the neonatal community. You know, over the last several years, there's been a movement away from treatment of PDA um, towards expectant management and, um, you know, a number of studies, um, looking at whether, um, treatment of PDA contributes to, uh, BPD and those types of, um, things. I was really struck in, um, when I was reviewing the literature about pulmonary vein stenosis, that similar to Erica's data, over half of the kids had a diagnosis of PDA. And of course we don't, we don't necessarily know from those studies of shunt duration, but um, you know, part of the discussion of um, the the length of uh, left right shunt duration, I think, is really um, interesting, particularly in light of the paper that you presented um, with those kids that have trisomy twenty one and and how each additional month of left right shunt impacted the development of pulmonary vein stenosis. So I think. Um, there's probably going to be more to come in that realm. Right. So may, may I add one, one other um, comment as well as probably a question um, that maybe Ryan could answer? You know, one of the things that we do come across with, uh, with the presence of a left to right shunt, especially like a PDA, is that there's so much pulmonary venous return, right? And so the pulmonary veins are very often um, they may not, they may look to be stenosis sometimes just with the volume that's coming back through the pulmonary veins. So sometimes it's also even challenging to really assess for pulmonary vein abnormalities on an echo um, in the presence of a large left to right shunt. And um, that has been something that has, that we've come across here, um, especially when you put in abnormal lung windows that can really affect your echo imaging. And so um, I'm curious if Ryan has experience with this. And if there are recommendations of how to look at the pulmonary veins in the presence of a left to right shunt, is there are there particular echo um, echo modifiers or you know protocols that are used to really try to get at where the problem is? 
right? Because I think that's um, those are the types of understandings that'll help to identify whether this is truly a variable to look at. It, Ryan, the floor is yours. There's some questions there that you can answer as you give your answer to Nidhi, um, but um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on all of that as well. Sure. No, thanks for having me. Uh, this has been great. Uh, Phil, I always enjoy your presentations for sure. Uh, they're very thoughtful. So um, Echo is great, great screening tool, but certainly has its limitations. I mean, it's, it's you know, the best part, it's non-invasive, you can do it anytime, um, and you can trend it. So, um, you know, it, it's a good start. And I think if you're looking um, and you do your best to see all the pulmonary veins as best you can, and that can be challenging, you know, with the, the smaller windows, hyperinflated lungs, and the, and the premature infant. So you really have to have a high index of suspicion. And so when you're dealing with left to right shunts, if you can get a great um, Doppler and you can see a wide vein and you might get a gradient, but the um, you look at the Doppler pattern and it's still phasic and it's still returning down all the way back to baseline, um, then that could be suggestive of just increased flow. So there's some hints based on how the Doppler signal looks um, within the vein, but even with that, it, again, it can be challenging. And so, um, you know, you do need that, uh, if there's anything, like you're not seeing a vein or you're seeing something suspicious, um, especially if this child's trajectory is not as it should be, you know, then that should warrant additional testing. And so uh, Chopra alluded to the CTA, which is great. You're going to be able to see the pulmonary veins. You're going to actually be able to see if there's any luminal narrowing there. Um, another option is a lung perfusion scan. And so um, I, you know, we've done a lot of echoes paired with lung perfusion scans to diagnose PVS, to um, to, to monitor for restenosis of, of PVS, um, those two uh, imaging modalities can really get a sense of, of, you know, give you more physiologic data of, you know, if a CT shows you a mild narrowing, you know, what is the clinical significance of that if, this, if the patient has normal flow to that lobe and the gradient is trivial? And so, or, you know, if you're getting um, a, a low gradient of three and left upper, but on lung scan, there's very little flow going to that lobe, then that would be significant of severe PVS. So I think the, you know, every institution has its own um, protocols. Um, some can do a lung scan, some cannot do a lung scan. So it's just not going to be available to everyone. In general, um, most programs can do it without sedation or with less radiation to CT, but that's not always the case. And so you're, you're always going to kind of play your institutional strengths um, with that next line of imaging. But I think uh, after you know, echo plus index of suspicion should lead to, you know, lung scan or CT. There's another um, question um, in the Q&A just about the diameter of the pulmonary veins to consider, to be considered PVS. I think that's for you, Ryan. Yeah, sorry. I guess if you're looking at, I, I would say you can't really measure um, pulmonary veins accurately by echo. So I'll assume that, you know, we're talking about, you know, cath or CT, um, and in that situation, you know, the disease is going to be on a spectrum. And so early stenosis, you're going to see a change in caliber um, of the vessel and the, where and it should be a focal narrowing and, and, and up more upstream, you're going to see more dilation. And so you're going to see uh, more a luminal change in caliber than more of a, you know, global diameter change. And as the disease gets more um, significant, there's flow redistribution away from that one lobe. And so uh, the vein can get smaller and smaller. And so, um, you know, there's no, uh, there's no, you know, number to say, okay, I'm going to give you two millimeters and that means PVS. It's, it's kind of on a, on a spectrum. And, you know, certainly if all four veins are under two millimeters, that would be um, uh, very concerning. But in general, you're going to see some sort of, you know, focal luminal narrowing, uh, which can progress to, you know, vein atresia uh, over the course of progressive PBS. Thanks, Ryan. Um, one more question for you, and then I'm going to kind of shift it over to Nidhi for some pulmonary hypertension questions. Can you you know, can you just talk about where the field is with the biologics um, um, and how it's used at different centers and just your own experience? A couple minutes. Sure. Yeah, uh, I'll be brief. So in general, there was kind of two main schools. Like, so there's Gleevec, Avastin, and, and you showed that slide, uh, Gleevec, Imatinib inhibits um, PGGFR and Avastin inhibits um, VEGFR. And so they're both tyrosine kinase uh, receptors that were identified on the myofibroblast-like cells that 
or within the um, intralumen, the lumen of the PVS um, of the pulmonary veins. And so those two drugs act to kind of prevent or slow uh, restenosis targeting those specific cells. And so, um, and so, and then apart from that, you have serolimus, uh, which is kind of an mTOR um, inhibitor. And so, um, and that there's a lot of, to talk specifically about serolimus, there's a lot of data on, on preventing instant restenosis um, and smooth muscle cell proliferation uh, with that medication. Um, and, um, there's little data on, on just showing on um, little data showing demonstrating effectiveness on you know preventing um, PVS without you know stents within the veins. Um, there's more data on um, Gleevec and Avastin, mainly Gleevec. Um, again, not huge hundreds of numbers, but um, you know the the main trial started with 50 patients, and then um, the clinical experience is now over 150. And so, in general. Um, um, we've seen um, when that medication can be given, um, you know, nine out of 10 days. So patients get at least 90% of their doses. And that's paired with, you know, keeping the veins open in the cath lab. Um, we've seen patients stabilize, which means no stenosis for six months. Um, on a vein level, if these patients are getting most of their doses as well, there's less likely to develop re stenosis and reintervention. Um, and then um, the largest surgical series published out of Boston did show a survival benefit when adjunct um, chemo being Gleevec uh, was given. So Avastin is, is given less um, because um, in our experience, just over 20 patients because it's given IV um, usually through central line every two weeks while Gleevec is given once a day. So, um, and that's kind of reserved for more high risk patients, the primary subtype, um, the full term who present with respiratory failure at three months or um, patients who fail Gleevec. Um, with that said, I would say probably more centers are using serolimus than Gleevec just because of comfort. I think the medicine um, is given to patients, transplant patients, and there's just kind of, I think, more comfort there. Um, but I think how its role in you know, preventing re and, and veins without stents, and it just, we need more uh, research on that area. But I think if there are no stents in the patient, it's uh, I think we can a aim towards Gleevec, but if, it, if you're, the patient's being tra treated with primary stent therapy, then um, I would encourage them to use serolimus to protect those stents. So that's kind of how I'm thinking about it, you know, black and white right now. And yeah, I think our, our last question um, is going to be for Nidhi. We just wanted to um, ask about um, if in general, when you have pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary vein stenosis, what are your thoughts on using um, sildenafil and INO? some of the pulmonary vasodilators. Sure, I apologize for the very loud noise. It's, um, it's happening in my office, I'm sorry for that. Can you all hear me though over the noise of that? Okay, I like to say from Myrtle, moaning Myrtle from Harry Potter. The, um, the use of sildenafil and nitric oxide in this population remains extremely controversial and at the bedside kind of hair raising. Um, these patients, especially the more pronounced the, the vein involvement, meaning the number of sites where there is involvement or the length of involved segment um, may not lend well to tolerating sildenafil. Uh, my practice has been um, to use more on the endothelin receptor antagonist pathway, as there's been some evidence to suggest that with the shear stress and the vascular remodeling that occurs, that endothelin is naturally elevated and therefore antagonizing its effect may allow some some remodeling to occur at the stent, at the sorry, at the stenosed location. Those would be medications like bosentin, embrocentin, uh, macetentin. In this population, what's been described is really the use of bosentin and embrocentin, uh, both of which have been used kind of anecdotally in uh, populations and some in larger populations. Although there's no there's no evidence uh, with the, you know a proper a randomized clinical trial to say that bosentin is 100% effective in these populations or that it's 100% tolerated. Um, really, when it comes to starting pH therapies on these patients, um, as Phil said earlier in his presentation, we really try to focus on uh, everything but everything but the medication. So really trying to optimize the patient as best as we can for repeated cath interventions or surgical interventions and optimizing the child's lung disease, trying to address other comorbidities or risk factors. I think that has really um, 
uh, those, those are known risk factors for the development of pulmonary arterial hypertension, right? So we try to focus more on precapillary modifiers of disease. If we, um, if as a, a patient presents and the pulmonary hypertension is on the arterial side, on the precapillary side, really is that significant and clinically apparent, and the child is really unable to be stabilized to go um, uh, to the procedure suite or to wait the time in between um, procedure interventions, um, then pulmonary hypertension therapies are often reached for. So this is separate um, from the biologics that Ryan mentioned earlier, um, and sometimes are used in conjunction with medications like sirolimus. Um, Bocentin, uh, when used uh, personally, you know, I target much lower doses. I don't use the same dosing regimen that is recommended for the pre-capillary disease. Um, I am a big believer for the pulmonary vein stenosis of occurring very, very highly on the side of caution. So using very small amounts of therapy and then increasing as tolerated. Um, and typically around this time of a cath intervention when the veins have been opened and things are flowing. Um, I, with sildenafil and nitric oxide, you know, one of the problems is that Although you'd like to treat the precapillary disease, sometimes the children don't appreciate the precapillary vasodilation that you create. So nitric oxide is a nice way to test it out, to test out tolerance of a, of a pH therapy. And we kind of, you can use that to just kind of mean all pH therapies, um, but nitric oxide is a nice way to switch on off really quickly to see whether there's any tolerance of it. And um, very often what you'll find is that there, there seems to be clinical improvement right away with nitric oxide, which then um, over the course of hours, um, you begin to pay the price for it, right? And so you then see uh, what will occur with prolonged exposure to nitric oxide. And so prolonged exposure to an oral agent, right? With bocentin and sildenafil, you're talking hours now of exposure and that you cannot undo or you know take away from a patient. So I think these medications, um, in, in summary, these medications, sildenafil, bocentin, they've all been used with varying success, but it matters a lot about the patient, meaning you have to choose the right patient, right? So it's not a one size fits all that you have precapillary disease with PBS. These kids all need to be on sildenafil or bocentin. You need to look at the, at the comorbidities, you need to look at the degree of pulmonary vein stenosis severity and um, level of involvement and um, also the child's clinical stability to tolerate your trial of these therapies. So I, I think it's, um, it still remains, just like the PDA, still remains a very important area of research and um, one that's hard to craft for, for studies, um, but one that is certainly very, very interesting and very appealing to many. Thank you. No, I, I, I don't think I could have said that better. Um, I think any... Uh, session like the one we just had that's running four minutes over. And thank you for people staying around, could run for another hour. I think what we've, we've learned today is that it takes a multidisciplinary team of neonatologists, trainees, attendings, cardiologists, interventionalists, pulmonary hypertension, pulmonologists, experts to really think about, um, as Kathy Jenkins nicely summarizes in her talks, patient level and vessel level approach to this really really unique disease of prematurity that we're still, I think, in our infancy uh, and learning more about trying to understand the genetics, endotyping, and phenotyping. And I think the panelists you see here on the screen today are some of the leaders in the field. And I know that there were other questions we didn't get to. Um, you have a link to the talk. Uh, people have my emails. Please feel free to reach out. And again, I want to thank uh, Shopa and Ryan and Nidhi and my uh, co-moderator, uh, Erica, and the Neonatal uh, Hemodynamics Research Center with Amish and Laura and Daniel and Shazia for the opportunity to present this uh, unique uh, webinar today. I uh, wish everybody a happy new year and uh, have a great rest of the day or night wherever you are in the world. Thank you. Thank you.